Ah, eu nem vou aparecer, que maravilha. Cinquenta minutos só.
Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hello, Lena. I can hear you. Uh, give, give me a, a couple minutes when we get started in about five minutes. I have some introductory things I need to talk about first. Is that, did you change your title? Is that a new one? <laughs> yeah, so I um, got a few conversations with my advisor um, okay. <laughs> and decided to focus in one part of the doctoral research. But it's good because people then have the title of the research itself, and here is one um, part of it. Great. Okay. It's your it's your presentation after all. All right. Okay. <laughs> hey, Bob. Hey, Michael. Hello, gang. We your way. Pardon me. I'm out talking to Alini. Alini, what time is it over there? Five thirty-seven. Whoa! 5.37 in the morning? No, five minutes before 7 a.m. Oh, okay, okay. It's still early for me. Oh, why? Where, where, where are you, if you don't <laughs> mind sharing? <laughs> I'm located in New Zealand. Oh. Yeah, that's something about these synchronous but virtual conferences you know our, we all have conferences with people in south africa and in thailand and in california and in florida <laughs> you know, people are everywhere they are that's why we're facing what we're facing right <laughs> that's right well that's true too <laughs> to move around yeah Another couple minutes and we'll get we'll get started. Okay, so um, yeah, um, you let me know. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, three o'clock, good afternoon, University of Florida Geography Department. Welcome to the first colloquium of the fall of 2020. We're doing this, as you well know, synchronously and virtual, which means we will go from the usual time and everybody scattered all over the world. The silver lining is that this format gives us an opportunity to hear more outsiders, people like geographers who are in alternative career tracks, including at least one alumni, I hope, biologists working in geography departments or on geographical questions, and other people not in the local area. I think I've lined up a pretty good group of people to give us talks, including the new PhD, they're the PhD students who are required to, and so on and so forth. Please note that this session is being recorded and streamed live on YouTube. If you have any objections to your image or your voice being heard like that, please just turn off your microphone and stop your video. You can still watch and still get the benefit of it. Before we get started, I want to remind the students taking this class for credit or taking it in anticipation of credit during a different term to fill out the enhanced speaker evaluation form and upload it to the Canvas assignments page when the, when this, when the colloquium is over with. You'll have a day or two to do that. Uh, faculty and other students can complete only the first page, but if you take the time to answer the in other questions in the enhanced form, it'll be excellent feedback for the speaker. But our speaker today is a PhD student presenting her required colloquium talk. It'll help her refine the talk so that she can use it when she goes on the road looking for jobs. Whoa, that was a noise. Okay, so anyway, Today's speaker is Alina Carrara, born in Brazil, grew up in Iraq. That must be an interesting story. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations in Brazil and then a Master of Science in Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She entered our program in 2016. Her advisor is Dr. Bob Walker. Her research interests are political ecology, land use, indigenous territories, Amazonia, human nature interactions, policy and environmental governance. She's published in journal like Tropical Conservation Science and plans to graduate this fall. So this is the last time she'll have a chance for this. Now she did give us one title, but she's changed the title. The title of this here is the Taming the Warazu, the quest for Arua's mm, territoriality. And Alina, if you would take it away and, and teach us how to pronounce the territoriality, we'd appreciate it. So it's all yours. You should be able to be, share your screen. All right, thanks for the introduction, introduction Dr. Beamford. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, okay, so thanks for being here. Taming the Warazu. The Warazu means um, in the Awas language, the white men. So the Awe is an indigenous group um, from the Brazilian Amazon, uh, occupying part of the Brazilian savanna. And uh, that's how they self-identify as Awe. However, colonizers have historically called them the Shavanti. So I'll be using those um, two terms interchangeably, just so I don't sound rep repetitive. But the Awe people, um, okay. And so I'll give you an outline. Um, uh -oh. So um, indigenous territories and territoriality uh, are the core uh, foundational aspects that I want to look at. And um, in this sense, I take territory as a concept that is a result uh, and a production of territorialization or human beings uh, organizing, mobilizing politically, socially, economically around a space. And territoriality, uh, the process that comprises all these um, characteristics of specific societies, specific land use, uh, what is that a combination of forces that produces territory? And so my focus is in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, and as we can see here in the map, we have around 400 indigenous territories. 
And here in more specific, I'll explain to you what indigenous territories stand for because there's a legal connotation on it, which uh, goes beyond the conceptualization per se. Uh, so this uh, region is home for around 173 ethnic groups, um, which comprises around half million people. So almost 50 known contacted groups and covering around over 20% of the Amazon region. So here in this um, here in this red dot, I don't know why. I think someone is sharing here. So in this red dot, um, apologize, technical issues. I I first encountered indigenous population in the Amazon on my early childhood, and I remember. Um, my my grandpa calling uh, indigenous people as Juruna everywhere. This is like Tocantins state by the Araguaia river uh, close to Ilha de Bananal and everybody was Juruna, uh, irrespectively of their age, their gender, their um, anywhere. Like, so a uh, young boy was a Juruna, young girl was a Juruna. So every indigenous people he would call it Juruna. I never got that, what that meant. Nowadays, I call it like the white savior complex, but uh, that's how I first encountered these uh, people. And so it was later in 1988 with the return of democracy in Brazil that the new federal constitution was rewritten and indigenous uh, people were protagonists in mobilizing sources and um, alliances with international organizations, environmental internet um, organizations. And they included the first indigenous chapter in the Brazilian constitution. And in this chapter, uh, there is a clear legal framework uh, ensuring and granting these people rights over the lands they traditionally occupy. And then the state becomes responsible for demarcating and protecting uh, their land. So it was in this context that I found out who Juruna was. So Juruna actually meant um, this guy here, Mario Juruna. He was uh, the first um, indigenous person to occupy the National Congress uh, in the Chamber of Deputies. And he is a uh, Nahue. Um, he's from the Awe ethnic group. And he actually has been advocating and fighting for he was since the 70s for land rights. He died in 2002, but he was always like a fighter from for indigenous land rights. He actually managed to demarcate his um, the land where he was born in 1975. And so looking at demarcation, what does that entail? So under the federal constitution of 88, we have seven administrative steps uh, to form what I call here indigenous territory. So indigenous people, they start claiming their land, uh, the portion of land, the space they occupy as indigenous territory. So the National Indian Foundation, uh, which is a government agency called FUNAI, we call it FUNAI, the acronym, the acronym. And so it's responsible to conduct a deep assessment to identify that land uh, with that people. So ethno, ethno development, uh, research, um, land use, environmental assessment. So it's a robust set of information that produces a technical report. So this technical report is then published. Step three is contestation. And then contestation is a period of time where non-Indigenous people can contest that technical report. If contestation, any contestation is done, the Ministry of Justice is responsible to mediate this conflict together with FUNAI. If no contestation happens, then FUNAI is responsible to promote, to, to publish a public declaration uh, recognizing these areas. And so after this declaration, the physical demarcation of the area is done by FUNAI also. And then with physical demarcation, the Brazilian president must uh, sign a decree homologating this land, recognizing this land, this space as indigenous territories and public, uh, publishing at the official net, federal official gazette. And once that is done, uh, registration under the secretary of uh, unions patrimony. 
So this is uh, the administrative process according to the law uh, for official recognition of indigenous territories. However, uh, they, this law is, uh, is, was promulgated around 30 years ago. There is still a lot of struggle over uh, land, um, land rights. And indigenous populations in Brazil, they're been advocating for uh, what we call demarcation for a long time. And they are claiming, in fact, those highlights are constantly, those headlines are constantly uh, all around people calling attention to the uh, ensuring the land rights, but also calling attention to these people's needs. And so in this context, I take territory as my um, foundational unit to look at an understanding process and that composes territory. So in the Brazilian Amazon territory um, is an artifact of contention. And then I, under, I want to, to understand how the Awe people territorialize their indigenous territories and how this is uh, unfolding at the present time. Uh, how do they express themselves culturally in space? How they territorialize their land? And what happens after an indigenous territory is demarcated? And, and so I came up with um, a set of questions. So what are the practices and relationships that a specific away community situated within an IT are utilizing to achieve their territorial aspirations? How this practices address this process of regional deterritorialization? Um, and if we take the IT as an artifact of state-driven um, land management and territorial order, uh, do this um, do this entity address the community's territorial aspirations? And if not, then how these people are um, filling the gaps uh, within their territorial needs? So in order to conduct this um, research, I relied basically on three main um, foundational theories. So spatial theory, indigenous geography, and political ecology. So um, space, place, and theory in territory, uh, in order to understand the Awe's uh, relationship with their space, the place, in order to understand how they create territory. So I took um, masses concepts on space as open systems and place as social relations, and also uh, territory as political action and resistance from Agnew. In terms of indigenous geography, I used uh, the refugee studies um, literature and theory in order to address uh, displacement and mobility of the Awe people. And political ecology allowed me to look at the Awe placemaking through territorialization processes. So then I used uh, the locality approach and added a feminist political ecology to understand agency intersectionality and forms of resistance and uh, indigeneity uh, was a very important literature also adding in terms to the um, occupation of space. So the Awe people uh, have been studied quite a lot. There are a lot of and a very robust set of content about uh, these people. I met them, so I've been interacting with these uh, people for around since 2001. So almost 20 years. And here, um, there's a lot of ethnographic work, a lot of uh, anthropological productions and cultural assessments and understanding of their uh, cosmologies and cosmogonies. There's very few little in terms of um, territoriality and this uh, territorialis territorialization in the making. And so that's why, uh, that's where my uh, research contributes uh, to the literature. So I'll give you more background why these people um, are so, uh, so many publications about them. So they identify themselves as Awe Octabi. Uh, they are part, which means real people, by the way. And they're part of this linguistic group, Macro-J, and they have nomadic roots. Uh, Zomori is a very important concept for uh, the Awe people. It's basically the act of walking. 
So through walks, um, knowledge is passed through generations, hunting and gathering happened, uh, mapping out territories and settling and moving and understanding the space through walks has always been uh, a practice of, for these people. And so the, we don't quite understand clearly the extent of these walks, but according to the Awe's oral history, they once uh, lived close to the sea. They came to, from a place close to the ocean. According to the histories they tell and they pass through generations. Uh, which is in fact interesting because recently there are a few genoma um, mapping, tracing through DNA uh, studies. Uh, they were published in Science and Nature. And actually they, um, their genetic data, the, the Awe, in this case here, we're using the colonizer word, Shavanti, as I said in the beginning, uh, use genetic data and show a strongly affinity to Australasians. So we don't quite know how they got here, but those are two possible origins for them to get into Brazil. Later, Kurt, uh, ethnographer Kurt Nimuendaju published a map uh, locating these uh, populations uh, in the Brazilian savanna between 1788 and 1844. Uh, literature indicates that around 1860s, they were located in the southern um, savanna portion uh, and then they crossed the Araguay River, fleeing from gold miners and initial colonizers. And so they occupied an area uh, on Eastern Mato Grosso state that comprised around 5 million uh, hectares, a huge area. And so Garfield uh, explored this um, walking, the Zomori practices in, in depth. And he came up with this representation of um, the migrations of the Awe people. So they land in this motherland, Sorepre, in the middle, and from there they occupied uh, huge swaths of land. So Serra do Roncador is a very sacred place for the Awe people. There's this movie that, um, if you want to know more about it, uh, Lost City of Sea, it's pretty interesting. But here we have an idea of how they occupied this region. And for the sake of this presentation, I'll be talking a lot about these two uh, indigenous territories that are Shavanti indigenous territories. So Marawat Sede and São Marcos. So mind this, num this, this words, Marawat Sede and São Marcos. So now, after they sat here, they were living their lives, doing their Zomori, until during the 30s, um, dictatorship Vargas came up with this march to the West plan in order to colonize the Amazon region and to integrate the Amazon region to the rest of the national territory. And uh, there were many expeditions um, during the, this, the implementation of the march to the West. And so around 16 years later, it was the first uh, Pacific encounter between the Awe and the colonizer. In fact, during the 16 years, a lot of expeditions happened trying to contact these um, indigenous populations and none of them survived, succeeded or survived uh, to tell much. Uh, so missionaries were killed by the Awe, uh, colonizers were killed by the, by the Awe, um, expeditionaries were killed uh, by the Awe and so, only 16 years later, there was a Pacific encounter. And here we can see the one of the Sertanistas, uh, Francisco Meirelles and Apoe, uh, a very prominent Chavanchi leader. And this encounter was enough for the Brazilian government to promote a big national propaganda on we have uh, conquered the Western Brazil. And so, the Vargas, the, the dictator Vargas, went to, flew into Mato Grosso, flew into this uh, Western uh, Brazil. It was actually the very first Brazilian president to set foot in this region. And here again, we can see Apoe uh, receiving President Vargas. And that huge national propaganda portrayed the, the colonization, colonization of this wild uh, woods and 
incorporating, bringing the indigenous um, to the wider society, the Brazilian society. And so in order to do that, um, the government aligned with Catholic missions uh, to prepare and train these indigenous to be Brazilian citizens, to learn the colonial language. So in that case, Portuguese, to practice Catholic rituals, um, to they work as labor force for fields to promote agriculture in order to integrate the Amazon economically. And so we can see that there is a drastic change in their population, right? So they lost more than, um, I mean, that more than one third of their population during this, this process of colonization. And so in the 60s, the military coup came um, in a process which in my research, the broader research I'm calling as national developmentalism phase. Uh, and with that, um, a robustus apparatus to develop the Amazon was put in place. So hydropower, uh, high, highways and roads, uh, large scale agriculture, which led to land speculation. And with land speculation, Marawat said that indigenous territories, the Oesha uh, territory, was the last one uh, that nobody has ever set foot in. And then, due to land speculation, the land where Marawat said it was located was sold to an elite group who later became one of the largest uh, landowners in Latin America. And so the Marawat said uh, happened as the last frontier was like the Savanchi, the Shavanchi were savage, they're the wild Indians, they're ferocious. Uh, nobody aimed at contacting these people. And so what happened was that one morning after the conclusion of the Waya, uh, the Waya is a very sacred and important ritual for uh, the Awe. It's, um, it's a ritual that uh, progress manhood towards uh, spiritual knowledge and power. And this ritual occurs, it happens around every 15 years, more or less. And so they were concluding the, this very important ritual one morning during sunset and, and, and out of a sudden the Air Force airplanes flew into Marawat Sevi, started burning their houses. Uh, kidnapping kids, co killing the elder. Um, and then as a result, they airlifted 300 people from Marawat Sede into a Catholic mission. And so it was the end of Marawat Sede that became fields for soy and cattle ranching. So this was the last frontier. Those are the last contacted Awe people. And this is already by the 70s almost. It was more precisely in 66. Uh, and so by the 70s, all Awe indigenous territories were subjective to regularization process, and they were all demarcated into islands according to the location of the Catholic missions. So this is how it looks like, and it still uh, looks like that. So we have around nine um, indigenous territory located in the western portion of Mato Grosso state. And from this whole portion of land, now they occupy around 1 million hectares in total, comprise a population of around uh, 13,000 um, people. So I mean, all the indigenous territories, there are a lot of indigenous living in the urban places as well. And so they were here, they were brought here in San Marcos. Uh, which is one of the first uh, Catholic uh, missions. So San Marcos is home um, for around 67 villages. And um, one of these village is where I conducted my field work. Um, and that's some of the results I'll present are a result of this interaction. So the Denimi party has a very interesting um, history because um, there are around 500 people living in this village and 20% of them were brought, they were inside those airplanes. So their story tell that they were subjugated to the Warazu. And um, in this sense, uh, other Shavanti, other uh, indigenous, other away who were already in the missions like for 10, 12 years, 
um, they were actually marginalizing these newcomers as well. So Danimi Pari was a scape and a form of uh, resisting uh, to that subjugation. And so they, they fled from um, the mission, um, the center part of the mission inside the territory and came to isolate themselves from the group autonomously. And so I'll talk a little bit about the methods um, that I used. So together with school teachers, we designed and implemented the Awe da Hoi Manawe workshop. So Awe da Hoi Manawe literally means Awe's well-being or living well. Um, so in order to develop and implement, uh, I use the Dadiri method. So among the decolonizing methodologies, uh, Dadiri is one that stands for deep listening and very few interruptions. So basically deep listening uh, in terms of generating underpins of a whole broad of context. So during the workshops, we relied on focus groups that were kind of self-led according to their intersectionalities, community mapping, storytelling, oral history. I also conducted a uh, surveys at the household level and territorial engagement was done through commuting to the nearby um, city through open-ended interviews. So all these methods were combined together um, and they offered a very interesting insight, which I'll be presenting right now, some of the findings. So some of my main found findings uh, concern to our territoriality, uh, their cultural spaces, and their perception of the territorial word, world. So the village itself, as we can see in the Zema image, has a lot of routes coming out of it, right? We can see Zomori here clearly. They're still walking, they're still, you know, there are some clear routes. And the way they perceive the world uh, is that it's formed in a concentric manner. So the village entails all the spaces, kinship, relationship, relationship amongst its members, the environment and the outside world. So the totality of this concentric spatial organization is the idea of raw. So I'll be talking about that uh, very soon. Is their territorial world which extends past the boundaries of the village and past the boundaries of the IT. So the creation of the world, the myth of the Paraninaya uh, between uh, the interaction between the light world and the dark world forming what we have here in this uh, representation, the crops, the water, which I'll be talking about, the village and the raw. And so this is a diagram that places this uh, important concepts, which I'll be talking um, in the next slide, which specializes culturally uh, the manifestations of Shavanti occupation within territory. So the raw, um, the territorial world, the ri is the house, the household, the ho is a traditional school. Then in the center, we have the water and the water is a decision-making process. I'll be talking about it. Um, the village is formed in a yuxo relocal manner, which means um, the houses uh, belong to the women and the men move into, after marriage, the men move into the wife's house um, and live there with the wife's family. And all the brothers from this household must leave at some point according to their own marriages. And so there are two moyetes, so Oawe and Porezaono, one facing sunset, the other one facing uh, sunrise. And they're always located, and this is a typical Awe village, they're always located facing um, a body of water. And I'll be talking about the king ties, which means backyards, but I'll be talking about them very soon. So here's another more uh, real um, understanding of how that looks like. We can see Zomori routes coming out from pretty much all around. So Oawe means um, big water and Porezaono, the other moyeti means tadpole. And they are complementary, oppositionally complementing itself themselves. So 
the water is the most um, central unit of the village. It's not a material place. Uh, it's materialized by relationships and gatherings that men, it's a very strictly male uh, environment, gather twice a day between uh, before sunrise and before sunset in order to um, discuss all relevant issues uh, concerning to the village level. All the decision-making process in terms of the village level occurs in the, the water. Another very uh, strictly male place is the Ho, as I said in the previous slides. The Ho is the traditional school. Um, this is very important for the Yahweh because this is a sort of um, legitimation of their village as an autonomous village. So a village that has the Ho and don't have to send their Wapte, which are the young men who attends this traditional school to another village um, is recognized as an autonomous because they are able to form their own um, leaders. And so the Wapte are young boy they're sent into this house and they remain between four and six years with no contact with the rest of the village. Uh, they only receive visits from their mentors and from their mothers who bring them food once a day. And, and I didn't have many access to this um, very male uh, environment because I'm a woman. So that's what I have to tell you about the Ho. Um, and so another very important unit it's um, the Ri. So as I said, the Ri is uh, the house, the household. So this is how it looks like. The Ri is very um, interesting. It emerges as a very feminine space. Much as the Wada and the Ho are masculine ones, um, the Ri, um, all the decision-making process uh, that is done in the, in the Wada publicly conversations between the men are actually a relational um, foundation of these conversations are related to the re. As my data showed, the re stands up as the foundational unit um, structure for the whole village. It symbolizes a locus of political function and all the actions and decisions made at the household level affect the collective unit. And so in this sense, the woman's voice are seminal within and beyond the village. So feminine dominance is present in both structure and decision. So they dominate uh, cultural, social, physical reproduction. And that being, brings a very important and a very strong gender role into spatializing uh, the places where they live. And the houses always beyond, belong to the older woman. And the reeks emerges as the most intimate spatial unit of belonging for the Awe. Another interest, uh, interesting space is uh, the kin are the kintais, which are literally the backyards. So when they came, they were brought from Marawat Sede into the San Marcos missionary um, space village. They couldn't practice their rituals. Their relationships completely changed. They were seen as savage, as animals, as primitives. And it was, uh, they start occupying the backyards. They start occupying the backyards in order to do and continue um, perpetuating what they believe was important in terms of their cultural practices without being seen by the Catholic priests and nuns and, and and all the Warazu people. So they start populating the backyards. The backyards is also a very strictly feminine um, space as well. Kids, there are a lot of kids running around. Hunting happens, gathering happenings, crops, small crops as well. And so before we move into the Ro, I am going to uh, talk a bit about these three important spaces that are not always spaces, that are not always places. Uh, they were brought by the Warazu. So the church, the Catholic church is there. And it was a clear, according to my data, it was a clear act of territorializing because it was like, we don't want to be with these priests. We want to be on our own and doing our own thing. Can we have your blessings? And then here's the church. Um, the school and the health agency 
are very interesting because according to Funai and to the demarcation process um, for recognizing indigenous territories, uh, one aspect of an autonomous village is a public school and a small health agency, which um, promotes or offers uh, up to tertiary services and also triage for moving them to uh, local hospitals. And, and achieving this was a very intense political articulation mobilization by the leaders in order to uh, bring this school that runs for elementary and secondary school with municipal and state funding and also the health agency. So also a very interesting process is that both these ed agencies, they bring income, they bring salaries, they bring uh, jobs into the village, they bring training. And, and so it was a clear form of uh, conquering or achieving territorial sovereignty and uh, territorializing. Um, so with that, uh, let's move into the raw. So the raw, as I said, their territorial world in a concentric manner that that whole notion. So let's say that according to the history that we have, we have um, registration that there were in the Brazilian territory. Um, we know a little of the parts of their Zomori, their territorial, uh, territorial occupation, but we know focus on this specific region. And here we can see the reserve, the indigenous territory São Marcos, and we can see the the Nimipari village. And this is a commute that we did a lot. So every day they're going to the city, every day they're going to, at least one person from one household is going into the city of Baja do Garces, which is located around 200 kilometers um, from the village. And from this 200 kilometers, 80 are unpaved road within the, the territory. So it's not like a very quick trip, but they do it like a lot. And then being with them and commuting with them and hanging out with them in the city of Baja do Garces, um, I could map out their presence in the urban space. I could understand what are kind of needs they had and what they were like doing uh, in the city. And that was very interesting to understand how they encounter modernity and how they appropriate and continue taming the Warazu in order to achieve what they need uh, in terms of territorial sovereignty. And so I understood there was a very deep process of selection. So in a lot of places, they're not welcome. Uh, in a lot of places, they're actually uh, forbidden to come. Um, mainly they were seeking for um, public um, agencies. So Funai, the federal police, the public hospital, they occupied the squares and they rely on the city a lot for food as well. And, and so understanding these spaces and understand how they indigenize the urban space, I can see a clear aspect of territorialization that goes beyond the village and beyond the indigenous territory per se in order to meet their needs. In fact, they go beyond uh, the urban place when they see, so that picture that I showed you before, like the president coming into the region, for them, that was a sign of like my chief talking to your chief. And so this is the federal capital here in the map. And, um, and um, we can, sorry. <laughs> and Brasilia then the federal capital became a very important hub for them to mobilize politically in order to meet their uh, land rights and territorial needs. They've been performing and like there are performances in, the, in front of the National Congress. I myself, you can see the image here, I have myself gone um, to Brasilia with them and, and understanding uh, what they were doing there, what kind of um, meetings they're having, what kind of people they were meeting and it was always associated with health and education. And so we can see clear tools of the Warazu um, in terms of utilizing these tools to continue their cultural resilience process through territorialization. So I'll come with a few conclusions right now. Um, 
And then I'm just going to kind of wrap it up with uh, indigenous territories and territorialization of the Awe and walk you through some final thoughts. So um, very intense uh, presence of different intersectionalities in many different spaces and many different places of our territorialization. Race uh, was a clear one in the urban space. So the racial cut, the prejudice, the, the, how that led to different spatializations and cultural manifestations of these people within the urban space. Gender, very strong role of gender and tie into the literature um, uh, age also are just crucial elements for our territorialities. So according to Agnew, territorialization is an act of resistance and cultural resilience. And this for me is a clear example of that. Um, their spatiality is informed by dynamic process, dynamic process of relationships which means all the relations are, are actually producing different ways of occupying space. Um, and this process continues despite all the efforts of governmentality through the uh, interactions with government and deterritorialization forces. And so in this way, when we look at the IT, uh, the indigenous territory as an artifact of land ordering from the state, this is how these people are seen. They're seen as a dot in the map. This is the indigenous territory they occupy. However, we've seen that they have uh, a much broader concept of Zomori and territorializing space. So they themselves do not think uh, about territory as the IT. In fact, this specific village, the people think that this institutional recognition was really important, adding protection to their territory. But they are very, very cautious about the state and on believing that the state would honor this fact. So they're always um, with one foot um, back. And their conversations about land is all about, you know, them and us, a clear presence of othering there. And here, uh, in my research, I call it the production of multi territorialities because they are producing multiple forms of territorialization in multiple scales and the intersectionalities add many, many layers and there are many other subtle uh, aspects of this space occupying. So some final considerations, um, ITs, they happen within legal frameworks, they're based on spatial concepts. However, they are frequently opposed to the concepts that result uh, from the community process. And this is very different. Like I said in the beginning, this Amazon region is home for around over 170 ethnic groups, different structures, different political structures, di different customary uh, laws, different relationship to uh, land. And so the IT kind of puts everybody in a box. Um, it does serve as an important reference uh, for political organization, and it does address some uh, anxieties in terms of indigenous people. It grants them constitutional visibility and legal protection. However, just some of these aspirations. Um, so indigenous land remain rooted in very limited visions of ethno development, and it fails to address process, processes of coloniality and equality that act as barriers for indigenous aspirations in terms of their territorial needs and uh, their well-being. So those are my final considerations. Um, I don't know uh, if you guys, um, Dr. Binford, if they're opening for questions, but thanks for listening to this. Sorry for the typos and the uh, mispronunciations and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. I suppose just chime in. And if they get too many people doing it, I'll ask you to raise your hand. So anybody has a question, just jump right in. Fascinating, Alina. Thank you. Bob, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alina. Yeah, quick question. You know, I hear a lot of stories about the indigenous areas and I, not ITs in particular, but places where the various uh, tribal groups are. And so you've made a pretty strong 
case for a, you know, a, a form of matriarchal social organization. And I'm just wondering how that can be reconciled with other observations people have been made. And I'm thinking uh, about 10 years ago, I went up the EDD and visited the Cararao, which is one of the Kayapo peoples. They're also Macroje. And it was the opposite. It was, it was a perverse form of patriarchy. Essentially, the, the women were enslaved to the men. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an ethnographer and I haven't had a chance to live with indigenous peoples, but I, you know, I mean, is, 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 is the variation that extreme or, you know, are there just different stories out there or, I mean, what, what's your reaction to that? Have you, have you seen the other form of perverse, I'll call it perverse patriarchy because that's what it was. So um, first I must say that there are a lot of performance a lot of this encounter with the Warazu uh, evolves through performatic actions. In fact, like when you're in the Awe, everything's about performance. There are always circular groups, dancing, chanting, uh, kids, groups that are forming spontaneously, naturally uh, within the space and the sounds and the chanting, um, and then they added the praying as well because they start practicing Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, but for the Awe specifically, women do not encounter the Warazu. Women do not talk in the city. When I conducted the service, uh, one of the questions is like, do you wanna to move to the city? Cause they're like, oh, you know, city lights, uh, city lights um, effect. Do you wanna to move to the city? It was like 99% said no. And the women, like their uh, facial expressions, their body, their physical reactions to that was like, no. And a lot of women don't even speak Portuguese and some of them who does, um, they're very uh, shy. It was very, it was a, it took me much longer to engage with women. Mm -hmm. And there was a completely validation of my own family as a common uh, source of like sharing the burden of being a woman once my family came in uh, during my field work because it was like too much to manage. So I just brought them in because, you know, but it was like a deep um, opening when that sense of share, shared burden came into place. And so what I see is that as we see as the Warazu we see the performance of the leaders. They only will come to talk if they have something to get in order to attend their own needs. Otherwise, they're like, they go to school. There are a lot of Awe people that went to undergraduate school. Uh, a lot of them have been training as health agencies. A lot of them are school teachers, but all the assets, everything that is produced, it's focused and returns to the village mm -hmm. level. And so I think it's hard to say in terms of like the Cararao, I don't know them, but I've had interactions, I've had, had interactions with the Kayapo and the Kayapo women, they're pretty tough too. It's just mm -hmm. like, they're not necessarily are gonna perform uh, politically uh, within the Iwarazu lenses, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else with any questions? Um, I have a question. Anini, right. thank you for the presentation. That was, uh, that was great. Um, uh, I was wondering, has the perception of the territorial world, you think that, you know, you, you're talking about multi-territorialization. Um, I was really fascinating to learn about all the methods you use to um, learn about this, but I was wondering, is there, has the, has the perception of the territorial world and the multi-territorialization, has that changed over time? Is there an element of change uh, that you kind of noticed uh, just, you know, while doing your research or even, you know, kind of looking at uh, published literature on the subject? And I know territorialization has not been written about widely, but yeah, just, just you know, just wondering if, if there's there's an element of change. It changes all the time. It's super dynamic. It mm -hmm. changes in terms of age, 
So if this uh, territorialization is happening to meet the needs of kids, it happens in one way. If it's in order to happen in to um, addressing the needs of women, it happens in another way. If it's like a political articulation through the village level for like, oh, community um, agriculture uh, practices, engagement with uh, tools that we will allow them to write projects, everything changes. The spaces they occupy is, um, it's really based on the needs and the needs like in a community level, they vary a lot. Like when you talk to the women, they go to the city. I would say that 100% of the woman uh, goes to the city to go to the hospital. They are the ones who take their kids. They are the ones who take their moms and dads. They are the one who takes their husbands. They are the one who takes their sisters and brothers. They are the ones who are responsible for this. So when we look at speci uh, the specializing within the urban space, uh, they are the ones. Uh, the women are in the in the hospitals. Men go to the federal police when there are things that must be resolved. They go to Funai. They go to articulate and mobilize politically in these spaces. So they are constantly changing. And um, through time, I believe it also has changed, especially because this specific community uh, group, they've been through a lot. I mean, their whole uh, territorial perception of home is not Danimi Pari, it's Marawat Sedi. Marawat Sedi is still the homeland. And a lot of them talk about going back there. And uh, so Marawat said it was uh, returned to the Awe people uh, in 2012. And the occupation of Marawat said is the reoccupation of Marawat said um, happens and a lot of family members of them um, are already there back in the motherland. And so that also affects this sense of where do you go? So they travel a lot to other villages. They travel a lot to other Awe territory. They have uh, intermarriage within villages, within other Awe territory among those islands that I showed you, like all of the nine. Um, and so in terms of their ritualistic practices, another, again, it's very performatic. We don't know, I think we know not even like what we know about their mythology and their perception. They tell what they, they wanna tell. And it was interesting because when they were the first Pacific encounter uh, that I showed you, it only happened because the Awe wanted to. They said, we tamed the Warazu. This encounter is happening and nobody's being killed right now just because we want to. And they still recolonizing the city and they're still territorializing the Warazu and they're still see as uh, taming the Warazu. And so this is always changing. Okay, we, we've reached the 350 mark and, and I think Mike Simonovich and I are willing to stick around for a little while if other people wanna ask questions, but those of you who need to go to other things can leave now. Uh, Alina, I have Thank a bit you of, everybody for listening to me. Yeah, Thank I have a bit of a technical question. Cool. Very simple one. You, you, you found people in the city. How did you find the individuals in the city? We're trying to do something like that in Cambodia. We can't, it's, I'm having difficulties. <laughs> yeah, but that's, um, that's how, that kind of portrays how uh, segregated urban spaces are. Uh, in Brazil. And Brazil is like, um, like Cambodia is a soup, right? You can move one thing from the other. Brazil is a salad. You can separate very easily, <laughs> you know? And so in the urban space, um, I wouldn't even have to, I mean, they, word of mouth, I would be like walking in the city, they would come to me oh, you're the one who's in this place working. What are you doing? Come to my house, come visit, come meet my family. You know, cause we're, we're like, oh, there is this Warazu person here. Oh, okay, there are opportunities. And so let's, so they would approach me as well. And people from other village, I was asked in the village I worked at, I was like, do not talk to these people. Mm -hmm. And 
it was only during the service that I could see the other faces that were not present in the initial, in the initial mobilizations of the work itself. Because I was dealing with the man, I was dealing with the elder. And then it was only when I was invited within the RE that I could see faces. And people would come to me in the city and I'm like, okay, I know you, you're from there. And they're like, okay, don't talk to other villages. Don't, you know, don't get. And so they, they, they did tame us and they did tame, like, you're not allowed to talk to that group. And so it's, yeah. That's not a method we're going to be able to use. I don't think. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I, I, does everybody have a little thing on their window that says live on YouTube? You see that? In there, there's a place to capture the YouTube link if you look at the down arrow. So that way you'll be able to re relive this if you wish. So, okay, so go ahead and do that. And, and other than that, I think we'll break up for the day. Uh, next week, we have Anita Marshall from the Department of Geological Sciences whose interests are in um, uh, accessibility and, and, and equity in geosciences education. Uh, something that surprises can be that the geology department is ahead of us on something like that. <laughs> so anyway, so we'll see you all next week. Thank uh, you guys. Bye. Good job. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.